Grief is like a long valley, a winding valley, where any bend may reveal a totally new landscape. But not every bend does. Sometimes the surprise is the opposite one. You're presented with exactly the same sort of country you thought you'd left behind miles ago. But it isn't. There are partial recurrences, but the sequence doesn't repeat. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness. The yawning. I keep on swallowing. When C.S. Lewis's wife died, he kept a diary in which he described in very vivid and very meaningful terms the emotions and physical feelings that he experienced at this time. His command of English is uh, impressive, but the grief that he describes is the grief that everybody shares at times of bereavement. And I know many of you in the audience have been bereaved. Others are psychiatrists, doctors, nurses, social workers, Samaritans, people who are concerned in one way or another with bereaved people. Grief is one of the most painful things that any of us will have to experience. To understand that process, I think we need to look at the way in which we build up our view of the world and what a bereavement does to that view. You could say that each one of us from the day we are born is building up inside of us a picture of the world, which on the whole accords pretty well with the world that we meet. When anything as big as a major bereavement, the death of someone you love, occurs, it's as if your whole world had been turned upside down. For a while, you lose your bearings. Um, it takes time to get your bearings back again. And during the interim, during the period when you're struggling to change your view of the world, to bring it into line with the world that you'll meet, you are going through a struggle, which, which is what we call grief. On the whole, this follows a pattern, which, for convenience, we can divide into four phases. And it's these four phases which I'm going to describe uh, now. I don't think one should pretend that everybody goes through each of these four phases neatly from one to two to three to four. Even years after bereavement, meeting someone who knew the dead person or finding a photograph in a drawer or something like that can put you right back to the first or the second phase again. So let's start by describing the first phase of grief. I don't want to see your face, Sophie. That's it. That's Tim, it. Uh, your wife died about four months ago now. Yes, right. How did that come about? Well, on... Um, she'd just been down the road to some friends, and she came back to change Sophie's nappy, and she just went upstairs onto the baby's bedroom, and I was actually next door. I'm trying to... I'm trying to, trying to rehang a, a door, and I heard a noise as though Sophie had knocked some water over and I went in to look, and I saw Judith collapsed over the cot, and I tried to administer artificial respiration, and she, she went yellow and blue. And You'd I, had no idea this was going to Absolutely no idea. I mean, <coughs> one minute she, she was her normal, happy self, and the next she, she was dead. Hmm. I mean, I didn't, I suppose, know she, she was dead. I mean, I called the ambulance. Um, but um, in the hospital, you know, and they later told me she was dead, and this was uh, totally out of the blue. Uh, she was uh, completely healthy. Uh, she just had a, a baby with no problems. <laughs> this baby, and um, yeah. and then you know, and then she was dead, and so it was 
Could you take, I mean, how, how long did it take you to take that in? I suppose I only really know she's dead for about a month. No, I mean, it, it actually it takes three months. Many as three months, yes, yes. I mean, it's just on... Um, but uh, in the first instance, what did you feel like? I don't think I felt anything. I said, put her to bed for me and, you know, just put her as she is, don't change her. Went out to get her bottle and she just literally rolled off the settee and hit her head. He picked her up and he didn't even think to ring anywhere. He literally ran down to a cab office, which is just mm. down the road. And, and took her straight to the hospital. Well, I left home at about quarter to eight, and by eight o'clock we was in the hospital with her. You know, they'd, they'd even got and me as well. she died you know, how long afterwards? Eight days later. So often we, we meet people who say, well, yes, the doctor did say something about the fact he might die, but I thought he meant 20 years' time, or... or uh, um, that one gets the feeling sometimes that the doctor was being very optimistic. And uh, because the family don't want to believe the bad news, they tend to interpret it as being just the opposite. They tend to treat it as if he were being pessimistic. And the final distortion is so great that many bereaved people, at the time of their bereavement, feel that they were not prepared for this, that this is something which somehow they hadn't expected. People who are suddenly bereaved, particularly where it's a young person who's died, the most immediate reaction is usually one of shock or numbness. People say, I just couldn't take it in. It didn't seem true. I found it, I found it very difficult to believe that it had actually happened. For um, some time, I felt in a, a dream as though everything was going on around me, as though I wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was, they were doing these things and uh, it was nothing to do with me. There's a lot of things to do, you see. There's the, you know, the registrar and the funeral arrangements. But I was lucky to have a kind uncle. I think a lot of people have kind uncles who help. And uh, till, until after the funeral, you really are in a dream. Well, I was very bewildered and shocked. And I felt very childlike. I wanted to be cherished and made a fuss of and praised for being good and I felt lost and I wanted people to direct me and show me what to do and tell me what to do. At other times it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There's a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. Let's move on then to look at the second phase of grieving. And I think this is what most of us mean when we talk about grief. Um, we talk about pangs of grief, intense feelings of yearning or pining for the dead person. Um, there are really two components here, two, two aspects of it. There's the yearning and the pining, intensely missing the dead person. And there is the feeling as if you had been unwillingly pushed from a relatively safe, familiar world to one that seems very unsafe and very un unfamiliar. Everything was unfamiliar and strange and unrealistic. And unreal, yes. Unreal. Yeah. And it was, no, it was no longer familiar. It's just beginning to feel familiar now. And without the friends who rallied round at the time, I don't think I could have got through that bad time. Mm -hmm. It's essential to have people around you and it's essential that they they talk to you about yes. anything but to talk, not to cut themselves off. What, what was the worst time? Well the worst time of course is nights. One goes to bed and no matter how tired you are you can't go to sleep and just to lie there or crying mostly. I just cried and cried at nights. Mm -hmm. I found some solace in it. Along with these pangs of grief and the anxiety and, and fearfulness that goes with a situation where you feel, feel lost and bewildered are all the physical accompaniments of anxiety, tension, fear. And again, these are things which very seldom in life occur as severely as they do after a bereavement. 
I think this is one of the things that I find most alarming is that as being a priest you know you learn from other people they tell you they tell you how physical a thing grief is and although people have told me this endlessly and I'd sort of shared this with other people as a piece of theoretical knowledge you suddenly discover for yourself you know the, the knowledge is one thing and the experience is something completely different um, I just felt the backs of my knees going. I felt, and I don't mean to be rude to him because I love his work, um, Henry Moore's statues. I just felt as though the middle of me had disappeared. Um, as well as this really frightening vibrating that I got um, late at night. and I just couldn't keep still and shook and shook. Mm, yes, it's a physical thing, all right. Yes, there was one time on which I think brought home to me how, how f physically ill I was. Mm. Um, well, I'd been doing some sh shopping in London. I'd been doing perhaps rather less walking than I would normally, but more than I ought to have done. And I, was, I got to a stage where I was quite near some moths in the, f the f fields. I knew I just had to s sit down or I might collapse. And I got there and I sat down and my heart was going on very fast and I really thought I might have a heart attack and I, I wrote down the numbers, the phone numbers of the people I was staying with and I almost passed out. In fact I didn't but I was very frightened because I never had anything like this happen to me before mm -hmm. and obviously with my wife having died from her heart just stopping essentially um, it, it, um, it was frightening. It's in your mind I suppose, yes. 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 And I would not realised how uh, until then how exhausted I was yeah. and that's yeah. what it was it was the body saying stop you've d you've done enough Not too much and <laughs> yes. normally I, I tell yeah. my body what I wanted to do and no one ever told me about the laziness of grief except in my job where the machine seems to run on much as usual I loathe the slightest effort. Not only writing, but even reading a letter is too much. Even shaving. What does it matter now whether my cheek is rough or smooth? To understand why reactions to grief are so extreme, why people have such difficulty, we need to look at the reasons why people become attached to one another in the first place. Now, in recent years, there's been a great deal of work, studies of child development, animal behavior, which show the, that the things that attach one person to another, one mother to a child, child to mother, or even members of animal species to each other uh, follow quite uh, similar patterns from one species to another or even between child and adult. The work has been reviewed and knitted together by John Bowlby in many of his writings and uh, he describes two main types of attachment behavior. One is the types of behavior that maintain proximity, that keep the loved person close to you, um, smiling. Uh, in the case of young infants, the sort of babbling that babies make, um, the tendency to cling to mum or dad or whoever it is. Um, we're all aware of the way in which this uh, affects the loving parent. There are another set of behaviours that come into operation when the child is separated from mum. And this is more concerned with the things that will get her back, that will induce reunion. And here I'm talking about crying, searching, following, all the things that go along with the kind of behaviour that happens when something's happened, mother's gone away, it's about time she came back. 
I'm getting uncomfortable. I'm getting, uh, finding uh, something alarming going on. So the baby cries and searches restlessly and drops everything else. He ceases to follow his ordinary, everyday behavior. And one can see why that kind of thing is very important. If, if we didn't have this attachment behavior, uh, we'd stay lost. And uh, clearly, uh, humans and animals need to cry, they need to search and follow, and to stay close to each other. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, human adults behave exactly like this following a bereavement. Uh, we know that it's useless walking the streets, crying aloud and searching for the person who's died. But I do think that we have an impulse to do just that. We have a very strong urge to cry, except that because we know that it's bad manners to cry, we suppress this, we tend to sob. Um, we tend restlessly to move from one thing to another. We find it very difficult to settle to any task for any length of time. I go around the house looking for things to stimulate a memory. Um, her clothes, perhaps. Um, Do you ever get uh, a sense that she, she has come back? Yes. Um, you know, there have been a number of times where I've been very depressed and I've had a, a, a sense of her love supporting me. Um, and there have been a couple of times that I've, I've heard her. Mm -hmm. um, or at least I, I've, I've, I think I've, I've heard her. I mean, I don't, in a sense, believe I've heard her. It's just, uh, it, it's just my, 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 my senses tell me I have. Um, yeah. yeah. Did that surprise you? Uh, intellectually, it surprised me in that I, I didn't, mm. I couldn't see any way that it could happen. Um, but it, I, I think you know, the one or two times it, it happened, it, 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 felt all right. it, it seemed quite natural. When a person's just waking up from sleep, they very often have quite vivid. Uh, illusions of the presence of the dead person it may actually take the form almost of an apparition. He came into my bedroom and stood at the foot of the bed and it was seemed so real almost as if I could reach out and touch him. This kind of thing. But then people go on, but of course I pulled myself together and woke up and it was my imagination. And this is a perfectly normal, natural response to bereavement and I believe it's part of the searching process. It's part of the way in which we try every way to get back uh, that person who's died. We've seen the faces of those we know best so variously, from so many angles, that all the impressions crowd together into our memory and cancel out into a mere blur. But her voice is still vivid. The remembered voice. That can turn me at any moment into a whimpering child. While you're grieving, you can't really pay attention to anything else. You lose your appetite for food. You lose your interest in sleeping. You lose your interest in other everyday activities. There's a tendency to go over in the mind events leading up to the death as if somehow one could find out what went wrong and put it all right again. Human beings are very adept at avoiding pain. We uh, find all sorts of ways of doing it. In fact, there's an entire chemical industry uh, which has the job of trying to find new tranquilizers and new anaesthetics to take away pain. So I went down to my doctor and he gave me some Valium and some sleeping pills. I'd take three Valium a day and two sleeping pills at night. And I took half a Valium to experiment and knock myself out, you know. And I thought, well, I'll try sleeping pills. I tried one sleeping pill and I felt so drugged and woozy the next day. And I just said, I don't want them. Um, I knew she was going to die, but I think deep down there was this thing that just in case she didn't, mm. I might be needed, you know. And I didn't want everything to be blanked out, you know. I'm not the sort to want to go through things in a haze. I wanted it all clear-cut and know exactly what was happening, you know. 
Because these medicines do affect different people in different ways, but your feeling that was that for you, they just blanked you out. And oh, not, yes, You yes. would rather have felt and suffered the pain yes. than had I it yeah, masked well, I out think and suffered less. Perhaps if I'd have, have blanked it out and, and not known a lot of what I went through, I think perhaps I'd have gone through it after. Yeah, you know, I, see. I yeah. mean, I've been through hell about five mm. times and all in the space of about two weeks, you know. Mm. Um, if I'd have had the pills, I wouldn't have gone through it so often, I know, but I think I'd still be suffering you now. Felt you needed to face it rather than yes. to cut it out. In fact, I think that it's the um, avoidance of grief and denial of grief which is probably responsible for a great deal of the physical and mental illness which does occur from time to time among bereaved people. So that I think we need to be very careful how we use our drugs and how we go about um, avoiding grief in this way. I'm not saying there isn't a place for drugs. I think just occasionally, um, if you've got completely exhausted, um, a tranquilizer or a sedative may pick you up just sufficiently to get, you, get your strength back and enable you to carry on grieving. But uh, I think the habitual use of uh, tranquilizers and night sedatives uh, is fraught with danger, and one does find some people who are still taking them years later, and for whom you feel that somehow their grief has been blocked. I've said that one can't avoid the pain, but one can share it. And, you know, there's an old saying, a trouble shared is a trouble halved. Um, there's a certain truth in this, and I think that uh, family members and friends and acquaintances who are close to a bereaved person can often be of enormous help by just allowing the bereaved person to grieve, sticking with them, in a sense uh, coming close, perhaps taking over certain obligations that they can't cope with, uh, perhaps um, making a cup of tea at the right moment. It isn't a matter of having a, a clever set of answers which will somehow take away the pain. People say, what can you say? What can you say? There's nothing that you can say that will take away the pain. But just being there, showing your willingness to be close, showing your care and concern, may be quite the most important help that that bereaved person is going to get. People did come around at the beginning, and um, then gradually they, they dropped off, and I was very hurt, particularly when, when I lost my husband, that friends who had been friends for years, I don't know, they may have seemed, felt embarrassed or I don't know what, but they gradually dropped off and there was only a few of them left. And I felt very, very hurt at people I'd regarded as close friends, were no longer close friends. They were, as a couple, we had lots and lots of friends and suddenly there, there weren't so many. Yeah. And this did, this did hurt me a lot. But when my son died, it seemed um, different. There were more people came around and stayed around. And I was very grateful for that, and I still am grateful. I see people as they approach me, trying to make up their minds whether they'll say something about it or not. I hate it if they do, or if they don't. Some funk it altogether. One friend has been avoiding me for a week. Perhaps the bereaved ought to be isolated in special settlements like lepers. To some, I'm worse than an embarrassment. I'm a death's head. Whenever I meet a happily married pair, I can feel them both thinking, one or other of us must one day be as he is now. People don't know what to do, or they don't know how they can approach you. And I know the first time I went back to work, which in fact I went back quite quickly afterwards, just for a day or two, I went into the office and everyone was there. They didn't know whether or they ought to kind of go out of the room or whether or they, or they ought to say they were sorry or, or what. And I think it's only the bereaved that can can solve that problem. I suppose the hardest part is when people come up and chat to you and then say, and how's our little girl? 
and you have to tell them that she died and she died only a week ago, you know. And they're so embarrassed, they just don't know what to say, you know. And the only things I could say was, look, it's okay, I'm over it. And they look at you as if you're cold, but you don't mean you've forgotten and you're over. You just mean that you're not going to stand you there and sob it. your heart yeah. out, you know. Mm. But they make any excuse and they're gone. A hundred years ago, most children could expect to lose a brother or a sister at some time. The death rate among children was so high that you weren't really a woman until you'd lost your first baby. So it seems a shocking thing to say that nowadays. But in those days, uh, you had a large families because you expected to lose a few. So that, in a way, every family suffered bereavements from time to time. We were all exposed to it. We all learnt what it was about. Nowadays, a person can reach late middle age or even old age without ever having been close to anybody who's died, without ever having suffered a severe grief. And we somehow feel that it's almost as if science had abolished death. We pushed it to the end of life. It doesn't really exist anymore. I think that uh, there are dangers in this, and I think perhaps we should try to take advantage, wherever we can, of the deaths that do occur, to talk about them, to help to share them with, for instance, children. Uh, for many children, the first death that they experience is the death of a, of a pet, perhaps. And I think that what so often happens is that the, the pet is sort of hurried out of the way, and there's some story about... Um, well, the kitty went for a walk, which is found somewhere else to live, or something like that. Uh, the child, in a way, is not permitted to grieve. You know, in our society, we have really been taught not to mourn, not to depress as a people, to keep a stiff upper lip. The person who is most highly regarded, you hear it again and again, a widow behaves so well, she doesn't mourn. Now, when I first started to write uh, this book on uh, death in the family, I wasn't really at all aware of the tremendous importance of mourning. And then I remembered that over the many years that I had worked with families, I had found again and again situations in which people come with a problem which on the face of it has nothing to do with bereavement. Very often it is a wife who comes to complain that her husband is so uh, rigid and withdrawn, never can show any feelings. And then when I meet the husband, he says, well, I can't help it, I'm just an unfeeling person. Until it emerges at some time, often quite, quite long ago, he has lost somebody who was, was important to him, perhaps a mother or a father, and has never mourned that person, partly perhaps because he didn't know about the loss, you know, until quite recently children weren't told anything about the death of a parent. Uh, and when he did show signs of mourning, he was quickly distracted, or he himself had difficulties to show feelings, and so what happens? And that such a person firmly puts a lid onto all feelings and becomes an unfeeling person. And it has been one of the greatest experiences, really, of my working life, to see what happens if I can get in touch with that repressed and denied feeling. The relief, the recovery, the move to itself is quite fantastic. Let's go on then to talk about another aspect of the things that affect the way people react to bereavement. I think particularly of the rituals and religious beliefs that exist at around the times of death. How do you feel now about taking a funeral? I think far more gentle. I've always regarded funerals as being the most important thing probably that I do, that with weddings in that this is when people who normally don't come to church um, come, as it were, un under our ministration. And I think to take a funeral or a wedding as though it doesn't matter. I always say to myself for a funeral, this is the most important funeral or the most important wedding that this couple will ever come to. And that, I think, has been heightened. And I've also found 
using, trying to use silence in the service, saying a little about the person so that it's not just one more funeral, which is very easy to happen when there are a lot in a day. I think that the burial service for the Church of England is very good. It says this person is dead, they have gone, and this is the final act for the mortal remains. And I think that is a kind of closing. And I think why I found burying Rini's ashes so difficult was that it was a sudden realisation, yes, it really is a closing, an ending, an end, not the end, but an end. And I think that there are notes of hope there. You sow the seed of hope in the moment when the despair may be at its greatest. My son had always believed in having a wake. He thought a wake was a good thing. And we did have one mm. for him. And we... What do you mean by a wake, exactly? Well, when the cremation was over, all his friends came back to the house and uh, we had a party that went on all night. And I know some of my neighbors thought this was a terrible thing to happen, but it was so spontaneous and so sincere. All the boys from the rugby club came along and the boys from the Surf Life Saving Club and they had lots of drink. And we cried a lot and we laughed a lot. And we did just exactly what Malcolm would have wanted because he believed this was the way to go out. And we. We had a real good party, mm. and I felt this was so, um, it was so right for him. My ideas of not having the ashes scattered went down badly all round, I think, except for my parents, you know. Um, you got the usual thing about, you don't want the ashes, they won't do you any good, they'll just bring back memories, you know. So everyone was trying to get rid of Zoe, sort of put her out of your oh, life, yes. scatter her yes, away. Yes, yes, you mustn't talk yeah. about her because she's dead now, you mm, know. Um, yeah. Where I'm staying, they said, do you want us yeah. to take the photos down, do you want them left up, you know, yeah. and they're left up. I don't want her forgotten, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, which is why we wanted her buried somewhere near, and mm -hmm. I didn't want her in a crematorium because we didn't know anybody in there, and she certainly didn't, you know, so she's in Nana's front garden. Um, Nana's over the moon. Granddad's as proud as ever, you know, and uh, we've got the only flowers that were introduced into it, and that was the rhododendron bush as a marker, as I said, yeah, you know. Yeah, which we looked at. In this day and age, we've not only abandoned a lot of the rituals of mourning, we don't wear black for long periods of time, uh, we don't uh, say prayers at regular intervals over the year after the bereavement, um, Things of this kind have largely been abandoned. And, of course, we've largely abandoned, or many people have abandoned, the belief systems that underlay them. We haven't yet found anything to put in their place, and I think this is one reason why many people today are particularly bewildered and find it particularly difficult to come through the grieving process. But even for those with religious belief, the feeling you get is, I want that person back now, and in a sense they have just as much need to grieve as anyone else. Along with this yearning, it's quite normal to feel very angry too. In C.S. Lewis's case, he directed his anger at God. Go to God when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of boating and double boating on the inside. After that silence, you might as well turn away. Well, I would felt as I had been deserted by God and, and... It seemed as though everybody had sort of forsaken me, nobody worried why should it happen to me you see mm. such a um, a good man and we needed him and loved him you see yes of course did you blame yourself yes i did i had this feeling of guilt um as though i should have known that my husband was ill as i should have realized the symptoms um when he complained of uh, pains in the arms it's always why. Now, why did I go out? 
Yeah. Why did I leave her on yeah. the floor when I knew she was tired? Why didn't I put her to bed? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's not reasonable, but it's something people do. Oh, yeah, you it? go back. Yeah. If I hadn't have gone out, if I hadn't have yeah. done this, you know, yeah. if I'd have put her straight to bed, hmm. it, it's always, you know. And but going over in your mind alternative things that might have happened, yeah, if only. Yeah, all the time, non stop, you yeah. know. It's, um, hmm. it's a question you never stop asking yourself, even now, you know. I, I, I always think to myself, what if I hadn't have gone out that night, you know? People sometimes pick on these things as if by punishing themselves they could magically make it all right again. Of course, if the relationship has been spoiled in some way, if you never did get on too well together, then you find yourself going over the regrets, the things, that the if-onlys, if only I'd been a better wife, if only I'd done such and such. One person who has taken a, a great deal of interest and added to our understanding of this problem is, is Lily Pincus, a psychotherapist from the Tavistock, who um, lost her husband uh, in middle life and found subsequently that many people who came to her for help had themselves been bereaved. Well, I've worked all my working life with family relationships. And I've tried to understand it from the cradle to the grave, so to speak. And so naturally, when I got to that age, that people began to die around me, and I had a lot to do with bereaved people, I began to wonder in how far the previous relationship did affect their responses to the bereavement. Now, working, my work was mainly with marriage problems. And even though each individual is unique and different, and each marriage is somehow unique, there are nevertheless certain patterns which one meets again and again. What did strike me throughout all these long years of work with marriage is that there were two fundamental patterns. And those were the couples who either needed to live a very identified life, who had to be the same, who couldn't bear to have differences at all. And the other great group was where these people who are just the opposite in a way, who choose each other because they were so different because they could complement each other. And even though these people very often had many more conflicts than the other group of people, I began to feel that they could cope very much better with the loss of the partner. The people who had to be so alike were really more one than two, you know? They didn't really feel like two separate individuals. And so when one of them died, the other one felt he couldn't live. While the people who had chosen each other, while they were so different, and who had led life, so to speak, in divided roles, uh, they seemed, with a bit of luck in their life situations, to be able to cope much better. Can you take this? I, Jenny. I, Jenny. Take thee, Kevin. Take thee, Kevin. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. And then one or other dies. And we think of this as love cut short like a dance stopped in mid-career, or a flower with its head unluckily snapped off, something truncated uh, and therefore lacking its due shape. I wonder if, as I can't help suspecting, the dead also feel the pains of separation, then for both lovers and for all lovers without exception, Bereavement is a universal and integral part of our experience of love. It follows marriage as normally as marriage follows courtship or as autumn follows summer. It is not a truncation of the process, 
but one of its phases. Not the interruption of the dance, but the next figure. I felt as though I couldn't see any light. It was as though I was in a, this dark, this dark tunnel, mm -hmm. and I couldn't see any light at all in the future. I didn't, I didn't know what I could do. I didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to manage. Mm -hmm. I had um, relations very kind and helped me a lot. But um, it really was a, a, like looking into this tunnel and not seeing the end of it. Let's move on then to talk about the, the third phase of grieving because as time passes, the yearning and pining gradually tends to grow less. The frequency with which the pangs of grief are evoked uh, diminishes. And people find themselves in longer and longer periods of aimlessness and apathy. I was very disenchanted with the world in, in general. One thing that did hurt me very much was my garden, which I loved. I loved gardening. I loved digging and potting around with plants. I resented it. I would go out and see, I'd go out to hang my washing out, for instance, and I'd see things growing, and I would avert my eyes and didn't want to see them because I, I resented them growing and, and Jack and Malcolm weren't, mm -hmm. weren't here. And things like roses and plants they had given me for anniversaries and birthdays, I just couldn't bear to look at them. I think the, what I miss most in many ways is sh sharing S Sophie with Judith. Um, I really miss that very much. Good girl. That's clever. That's clever. Isn't it? Poor greedy little girl. Also, I'm not used to, uh, to living alone. And I think coming to terms with living with alone, loneliness. with loneliness, I mean, I've got lots of very good friends, but it, it's not the same as having a wife. And um, I'm just reaching the stage where I now have to start to on uh, um, to structure a new life, and I'm finding it very difficult. I mean, it is the, in a sense, the first three months are easy, because one, one they don't just sound easy. Well, they don't sound easy, but no. I mean, in a sense, they are because it's obvious what you're going to do. I mean, you're going to be very grief stricken, and you're going to cry, and people are going to run around doing things for you. you. Can somehow accept the pain uh, and come. Yes, through and you it. accept that, and then you reach a stage where, well, for instance, at a dinner party recently someone who didn't know me asked me if I was married and I said no. And that's the first time I've, I've been able to s s say that. Now, att attitudes like that on the, have to change. I mean, I'm not married now. Bereavement isn't a time when you take a knife and cut off the past. You don't leave it behind. You carry it forward with you. And as I see it, each of us needs to tease out from the past those things that go on being important and significant and discovering what things you can carry forward and what things you can leave behind. An example of this is the way in which many people retain a sense of the presence of the dead person somewhere near at hand. Well, he's just everywhere with me and I have um, a corner I call Charlie's Corner with his photograph and um, a vase he bought and uh, I keep flowers in it, but I don't buy the flowers. I get them from the garden. From his garden, there. yes. yes. Or the only time Do you I buy... go there and talk to him? Um, not in the garden. No, I in talk Charlie's to... Corner. Oh, Charlie's Corner, yes. yes. If I'm worried, I often find myself uh, asking him, what shall I do? It seems a strange thing to do, but it comes quite natural to me. And um, you find that helpful? I do, yes. Yeah. I like yeah. to feel he's there. I, I don't think I shall ever forget him. Something quite unexpected has happened. It came this morning early. For various reasons, not, not in themselves mysterious, my heart was lighter than it has been for many weeks. 
For one thing, I suppose, I'm recovering physically from a good deal of mere exhaustion. And I had a very tiring but a very healthy 12 hours the day before and a sounder night's sleep. And suddenly, at the very moment when so far I mourned her least, I remembered her best. I indeed, it was something almost better than memory, an instantaneous, unanswerable impression. Say it was like a meeting would be going too far, yet there was that in it which tempts one to use those words. It was as if the lifting of the sorrow removes a barrier. The speed with which people come through to the fourth and final phase depends enormously on circumstances. Obviously, if you have, for instance, surviving children, a new marriage, new commitments, things of this kind, it's easier to move on and reorganize your life than it is if you don't find very much around which tempts you to uh, a worthwhile existence. Um, I think it's probably true to say that uh, many uh, widows in later life may find it very difficult to find a new place for themselves. People say, um, I don't like to think of myself as a widow. And uh, uh, it's certainly uh, a daunting task for a bereaved person to, to find new directions, but nevertheless the directions are there to be found. I've tried to open up some new fields in my mm -hmm. life. I've mm -hmm. extended my Red Cross work to helping in the casualty ward of the hospital and this has been a, a new experience for me and it's helped to lessen my troubles in a way. I've joined the Amateur Dramatic Society and I help with the props, not, I don't act, but I help with the props and general dog's body. I am trying to paint very badly, but it does absorb some of my time. And um, generally I've been trying to do things I've never done before. Grieving is not only a psychological reaction to death, it's also a duty to the dead. And there may come a time when people need permission, need to, need to be told that they've done their duty, and it's all right to go out and meet people, and they don't need to be um, gloomy for the rest of their lives. I wasn't quite sure how to go about it. I had to think it out, and I had to wait until I was not quite so distressed before I could really put my mind to it and think, what shall I do next? Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided the more people I met and talked to and the more um, hobbies and things I could do, you know, it would help a lot. Were there any clubs or organisations or anything like that that you could turn Well, I to? did hear of um, the cruise organisation and uh, I didn't realise what it was really. The Organisation for Widows? The Organisation yeah. for Widows and Children. Well, it was very hard to walk in, but uh, after a, a few meetings, I began to make friends with people, and it really has been wonderful for me. Yes, talk naturally. Naturally. You don't <coughs> hear yes. speak about I used to love to hear people talking about my husband, you know, and to talk about him, <coughs> and I think people are afraid to mention. And you, wouldn't yeah. have, and you wouldn't have minded crying? Oh. I mean, you wouldn't have well, minded... Well, no, as a matter of fact, I didn't cry, uh, but I was in a kind of a daze. I, I, I don't think I cried for such a long time until I became more myself, in a way, and my emotions became more natural, and I would cry suddenly, unexpectedly, a long time later. <coughs> but I walked around in a daze, and a lot of my neighbours just walked in the house and did things for me, so I was very lucky. They just walked in, washed up, and saw to the children and, uh, and were, were friends from the very beginning, which uh, I found meant what, one, one of the, the most moving phone calls that I got was from somebody who I don't know very well and don't speak to a lot, a, a sister-in-law of mine. And um, she was the only person who telephoned me, dialed my number on the telephone and said, Oh, Sue, just that. Yes. And that made all the difference. Yes. She didn't come out with platitudes or anything. She just yes. made me feel that she felt the same way as I felt. Yes. I felt that I, when I had to telephone people, that I was the one that was helping yes. other people. Yes. That you, you dial their number and tell them, you know, that your husband had died, 
and they would start weeping on, or, or, or be so distressed on the other end of the telephone and I spent the whole of the day comforting every other person. Organised group discussions for bereaved people have been introduced because many of the traditional ways in which people used to get together seem to have vanished. People are often very isolated in today's society and it's usually only in a major disaster when many people are bereaved together that we find ourselves forced to share our grief. You'll probably remember the very sad TV pictures of the grieving people after the disaster in Aberfan ten years ago. I think we can learn something from what they went through. Uh, a number of us visited Aberfan during the next year or two to try to help, to try to um, do something for this community. And I must say it was very encouraging to see the way in which gradually people began to come through their grief and the enormous support that they got, got from each other. Uh, though we were a bereaved community as such, uh, there were different depths of bereavement. There were obviously um, situations where people felt that they were helpless. They didn't know how to be of assistance to other people. And we wanted this cleared up. And so we needed a bridge, a bridge of thought, a bridge of words, a bridge of deeds. And we needed something for the future. And the only thing that is relevant to the future is hope. This community has raised its leaders, it's raised its artists, it's found talents that you wouldn't think of existed in a small community such as ours. But through the unfortunate disaster, uh, these talents have come forward and now our aim is to nurture them help them, encourage them, so that whatever else happens from this disaster, this disaster won't have meant that lives are lost in vain. I think one can see how the community itself was trying to say, OK, let's try and bring something good out of this bad thing that has happened. And this is something that occurs to many bereaved people. As the time comes when they reorganize their lives and they begin to realize that there are certain things that they've learned from this experience which may make them sadder people but certainly more mature, more real people. I think in this world we often, um, as I've already said, we tend to ignore the fact that death and pain are still realities. And bereavements bring us up short. They make us realize that this, in fact, is a part of life. In a way, grief is the price that we, we pay for love. And hopefully, one can accept that price. We should be prepared, when we accept love, to accept grief too. Because if you can accept grief, then you can grow through it. And you can come to a new kind of existence, which may not be so bad. I've gradually been coming to feel that the door is no longer shut and bolted. Was it my own frantic need that slammed it in my face? The time when there is nothing at all in your soul except a cry for help. Maybe just the time when God can't give it. <laughs> You're like the drowning man who can't be helped because he clutches and grabs. We have to cope with loss, really, from the moment of birth. I mean, even to lose the mother's womb is a loss. But it's also, again, because the baby comes to life. And even though from the word go, humans have to cope with loss and very often respond to it with depression or regression, going back into more childish behavior, we also know that there is a gain in every loss. And if we can see death and bereavement in terms of the total life cycle, 
then we know that they can also be a gain and loss. For example, the people who can lead richer or fuller life. I'm still as mad as I ever was. I don't think I'll ever change. You know, I've always been a slightly scatty person, but I've grown up. I, grow, I grew up overnight, literally, you know. The, I don't think I aged. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody tell I know what you mean. I, I, but, I, so I, I can see up. that. You've yeah. become more mature. Yes, I've really yes. grown up. You yes. know, I've always been sort of youngish yeah. and I've always been mad, but I think I definitely grew up, you know. Why has no one told me these things? How easily I might have misjudged another man in the same situation. I might have said he's got over it, he's forgotten his wife when the truth was he remembers her better because he has partly got over it. <laughs>